It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 253 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 5th of February, 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. It is good to be back. I hope everyone had a great break. One good thing that happened over the break is that we went live on Patreon. So this will just be a quick announcement and then we'll get on with the show. But a few people have gotten in touch with us over the years and said, uh, how can we support the show? How can we thank you, help you buy a beer, say thanks for doing this show? And now you can. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate and you'll be taken to our page on Patreon. All you do is sign up there. You can donate on a per episode basis. Uh, you can throw in a dollar if you want or as a scale up to $10 uh, for if you really like what we're doing. Uh, like I said, it's on a per episode basis. So if we skip a week or we go on another long break over Christmas, you don't get charged unless we put out a show. You can also set a monthly limit so you don't go over that limit if we go nuts and put out shows every day or something. <laughs> so unlikely. So, <laughs> which is not going to happen anyway. But, um, yeah, if you want to help us out, scienceontop.com slash donate. We'd really appreciate a little help in getting the, the running costs paid for here. So. And we'd appreciate knowing that you're grateful for what we do. But let's get on with the show now. Uh, and Lucas, we once again return to Tabby Star, the strange star one and a half thousand light years away. Uh, to recap, this is the star with the strange pattern of dimming and then brightening again almost randomly. Uh, and it got a lot of media attention because of speculation that it might be an alien structure built around the star. It's almost certainly not that. But there is now a new explanation as to what could be causing that pattern, right? Yeah, this is uh, pretty cool. The uh, Obviously, <laughs> as you said, we've discussed this quite a number of times mm -hmm. and it, it drew everyone's attention because of the... the um, you know, pondering that, that maybe these, this dimming pattern was because of uh, some sort of alien megastructure that, that may have been built around it, something like a Dyson sphere that may have been in the process of being built. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's uh, it's, it's really quite handy to, to grab the public attention with those sorts of things. But, you know, it's also really uh, important to state how incredibly unlikely that is. Um, and, you know, I think, we, you know, the, the ongoing theme has been we don't know what it is. We're pretty sure it'll be some kind of natural uh, thing. Uh, but whatever it is, it's really cool that we don't know what it is because that's when we learn. Mm -hmm. So a new team, or I don't know if they're a new team, a team. There's a team. <laughs> the A team? <laughs> Not the A team, <laughs> no. <laughs> there is a team um, who have uh, uh, proposed this, this new uh, this new uh, theory as to what could be causing this new hypothesis. So this uh, this team's from the Columbia University and the University of California, Berkeley. And basically, they've suggested that this could be the result of Tabby Star having basically had a messy meal, having eaten a planet uh, at some point in the not-too-distant past. And um, some modelling that they've done has shown that if, they, if the planet, if, if the star had actually you know, taken in a planet um, of maybe Jupiter size or more, then it's quite within um, the uh, the tolerance to, to match up with the observations to show that the original observations that um, and original plates, uh, photographic plates going right back to the years 1890, um, and then consequent, uh, uh, you know, f photographic uh, record of, of, of this star in between 1890 and 1989 uh, um, have showed basically this, this decrease in brightness of about 14% continuously over that time. And then, of course, the ones that we, we know about more recently were with these sudden, sudden drops of brightness of, of between 15 and 20% over the, the course of basically, you know, months and then a year. Um, uh, 
so so they they modeled this uh, you know ingesting of a, a jupiter sized object anywhere between a few hundred years ago to up to you know 100,000 years ago and yeah it basically showed that um, you know the initial ingesting of the planet would have caused the star to brighten quite considerably and then um, it would have then very very gradually dimmed um, and that that uh, if you were to plot that dimming rate, um, it would f quite well line up with the uh, the fourteen percent over those years that I mentioned. And they further uh, suggested that perhaps the sudden drops in brightness of the fifteen to twenty you know to twenty two percent in recent times could well be clouds of debris. Uh, left over from you know this event, which are still basically orbiting the star, and if we just happen to be lined up um, along the uh, the orbit of that, then you know it could well pass in front of us, and and these these clouds of, or dust clouds or debris clouds could be quite significant, and that's always been the the challenge of this. So how do you explain something that is you know causing such a dimming event? It means it has to be quite a large um, you know, uh, object or, or group of objects that are passing in front of the star. Um, so they're also showing that in, in one of the scenarios, which is um, that rather than a single planet, maybe it was a whole lot of things, like a whole lot of, um, you know, several kilometre uh, rocks, maybe a few hundred or thousands of them. Um, then a whole lot of that, like yeah, the we, remnants of a planet or something. Yeah, absolutely. And we, you know, we know just looking from our from our own um, solar system that, uh, you know, very early in the solar system, it was a really, really, really crazy place, and there was stuff hitting other stuff, um, and this is what caught, you know basically led to the formation of the planets. So there were periods of times during which um, objects were hitting things. In fact, that's one of the you know, the leading um, uh, theories as to the, the formation of our moon was that something, you know, ru you know, a little bit smaller than Mars basically whacked into the, the side of Earth and, and, um, and, you know, the remnants of that is, is, is what's, uh, what's orbiting around as our moon. So, you know, we know that these sorts of things do happen. The other thing that we also know is there are often planets that uh, when they do form, they're not in, in totally stable orbits. And, you know, obviously one of the, uh, the ways that we define a planet is that it has cleared out its orbital path. There is nothing really else in its orbital path. It owns the area, if you, if you like. So uh, that period of, uh, of, of, you know, of the, the planet sort of settling down into their orbits and owning their path can also be a period during which objects are flung around. Mm. Um, so it's, it, uh, you know, the, the classic three body, uh, interaction thing, which we've discussed before on the show as well, where you can have, you know, basically a planet coming near another planet or several planets lining up in, in a form of resonance that can, that can cause the combined gravity to throw things around. So that also could quite easily have thrown something in towards the star. So, you know, certainly the, this sort of event is not unusual. Um, you know, on a cosmic scale, it's it's fairly unusual. You know, in a, in a human time frame, but um, it, it can certainly happen. So, uh, as is this um, has this been accepted yet? No, not at all. Um, there's there's still more observation to be done, and 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 the good thing is now um, the the modelling allows for certain predictions. Mm -hmm. It allows for a continued plot line to figure out how that dimming will continue. So it may be a matter of just keeping an eye, as they certainly are already anyway, on this star. Um, just to see whether that lines up and, and, you know, there may be more theories that are thrown out there, but this certainly seems and it feels mm. very um, likely and, and, and the most likely one that I've, I've heard of to date. Yeah, I, mean, I, I suppose the question is, though, that like, so this planet, this system is very much like our own in terms of how old its sun is, right? Like the Tabby Star is, is, is about the same age as our sun and it's very much like our sun, isn't it? From memory, uh, I, I don't actually recall to I tell think, the truth. Uh, yeah, I, I, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, let me know. But I, I, I have a feeling it's very similar to our sun in terms of its age, its type of star, um, which is why it was so unusual. Like, you know, why was this happening? Like, this isn't some weird red giant or something that's behaving erratically. This is supposed to be a very stable star. So, why is it doing this? So, mm. my question would be, if this were the case, like, is this common for for systems like this to have a planet that is? approaching like is it being drawn into its sun does this does this happen more often than we think like is the dogma that these state systems are stable not so much dogma anymore you know what i mean like um, is it 
Yeah, I, th- I think uh, we're we're venturing out of um, my knowledge space here, but I but I I do know that these sorts of interactions are quite common, and they still happen in our own solar system potentially. I mean, we're we're very very good at um, uh, predicting. Um, where objects in our solar system are going to be in, in many years to come. But after a certain number of orbits, once you get into many thousands of orbits, it starts to introduce a certain amount of uncertainty because there are so many unknowns and so many things that you can't quite account for. And and, and it's very important to realise that, that objects do impact upon each other. I don't mean physically impact, although that happens sometimes as well, but you know, uh, the gravity. objects, like, yeah, yeah the, the gravitational interactions that occur between objects do actually change the orbits over periods of time. So the other thing is um, uh, is is potentially other wanderers. So we know that that um, that planets can be thrown out of their systems by by these gravitational interactions, and then they basically become wanderers. Um, they uh, would be set, uh, you know, on on some sort of path, and they they could well perturb the orbit of things in in you know the outer regions of a uh, of a system quite easily. Um, this has been proposed for our own solar system to explain certain events that have occurred in Earth's history in the past. Nothing really concrete has, has, has come out of that, but um, you know, you may have heard of things like Nemesis. Um, as, <laughs> as a, um, yeah, and, and, yeah, so planets and stars that are that have been proposed to have perturbed the orbits of things in our outer system and, you know, particularly throwing comets and so forth in. So th- there's lots of things that can happen that can mess with orbits. Mm. Um, and then, you know, over the time frames that we're talking about, you know, considering the number of stars that are out there and the number of planets that are out there, and we're starting to realise that pretty much all stars have planets um you know it's becoming the norm um then yeah you know you 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 look at uh, the number of them for long enough you're going to see an event like this i think yeah. so that's just you know first principles thinking that through but um but yeah i i, I don't think it's unreasonable at all yeah i also like the idea that it's look everybody was looking at this as a sort of a dimming event like you know you start with something that's a known quantity and it's getting dimmer mm. whereas this sort of throws it the other way around and says, well, no, what happens if it's brighter than it should be? Because it's eaten this Jupiter-sized planet or, you know, a few of them, um, and now it's returning to its normal state. Yeah. I kind of yeah. like that. That's it's, it's an interesting thing. <laughs> that's the thing. It, that's that's yeah. exactly I, I agree. It, you know, it's, it's a really nice fit because everything else requires you to, to explain why something would progressively dim, and that's mm. really hard to explain. Mm. Yeah. Whereas if we're talking about returning to its previous state, then that's, you know, as I say, it, it really it fits quite sense. well. Without having to invoke all sorts of crazy stuff, so yeah, I personally was rooting for something you know approaching us that just <laughs> lined up as I've mentioned before. But even that would very very quickly um, you know <laughs> cease to be an issue because the you know th- that star is moving against the mm-hmm. background anyway. So if something were approaching us, then it wouldn't it wouldn't stay lined up for too long. Yeah, it really no. depends on where it is. But um, but still, um, you know I. I, I even this changes some of what we knew, and that is always yeah. cool. Always exciting. Um, yeah. I haven't been able to find out how old the star is, but it is 1.43 times the mass of our star. So, okay. Which is nothing. I mean, yeah. that's really close. Yeah, that's yeah, very yeah, close. Really close. But, is, but, is this now, but is this based on brightness or is this based on composition? Uh, or? I don't know how it was calculated, yes. but it would. Yeah, because I'm, I'm wondering if they, if they based it on brightness. That, that is true. All our calculations that are based on our assumption of what it normally is could be off if it is normally dimmer than what we thought it was. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we have multiple things that we can use to figure out, you know, what sort of class a star is and, and what its mass is. And obviously the uh, spectroscopy is a, is a big part of that. So, you know, we can we can see based on the... the um, uh, the absorption lines when we're looking at the spectra of what this star is made up of, and then based on you know based on that information and based on its interaction with other things nearby and how fast it's moving, whether it's moving away from us, all these sorts of things, we can we can get to a reasonable estimate as to its mass, um, and and obviously that that becomes less and less certain the further away it is from us. Um, but yeah, there's there's you know. You, you're right. I mean, the, the brightness is one of the key things that we use to judge distance. So, um, you know, that, it's one that, that can absolutely. Yeah, yeah it is, and, and it is it is one of the most important ones. Mm. So this is why the standard candles and, and all the various types of stars that, that have, you know, very, very known nailed down masses, you know, within a very, very small range and, and therefore 
based on the mass and and their makeup, what 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 makes them up, um, ha, has a, a direct correlation with how bright they are, which means you can use them as standard candles. So yeah, it's uh, it will be interesting to see whether you know things get adjusted as a result of this. But uh, yeah, it's been nice to sort of see a story like this unfold over such a short time frame. <laughs> relatively speaking, we can we, we could yeah. stay you know on the story, which is cool. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually one of the few stories I've seen over the last few years that ha- that has been followed up on in the, in, in the you know, in the mainstream media anyway. Yeah, yeah, so I agree. It's, um, it's really good. It's a, yeah. it, show, it shows the process. Yeah, like it. it shows how science works as a collaborative effort. These are um, the, the, the initial team who discovered, that noticed the pattern, put it out there and said, hey, everyone, something weird is happening with yeah. this. And in order to get a bit of media coverage... Is it an alien megastructure? Is it a Dyson sphere? But that means everyone goes, unlikely. Let's have a look at this. And so you get lots of teams from all around the world going, hey, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Let's do the modeling. Let's see what it could be. And, you know, it is probably going to be a while before we have anything definite, but this seems to be one of the more credible explanations. So that's very cool. Yeah. Uh, Well, Shane, another story that we've covered quite a lot on the program is about how babies first get their microbiome. Uh, and some studies have suggested that a vaginal or natural birth is important for giving newborns that first mouthful of bacteria to seed their gut flora. And now, a new study indicates that it maybe doesn't matter at all how the baby is born, whether it's a cesarean or a natural birth. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. This is a this is an interesting study. Um, as as you said, Ed, that there's multiple studies have been done on this on this subject, and um, yeah, and obviously. <laughs> it's also a bit politicised, obviously, because there's a whole association with, you know, are people doing fashionable cesarean births because they don't want to, you know, ruin their nether regions, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> well, possibly also they don't want the agonising pain of childbirth. But... Yeah, well, that too, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, but this, this has become increasingly – it's a sensitive subject for a lot of people. Yes. Um, and one of the and one of the arguments against it has been this idea that well, during a natural vaginal birth, um, some of the mother's microbiota gets passed to the baby, and that you know like through ingestion because you know, childbirth's messy as everyone who's given to birth knows, um, and the baby will swallow some of these uh, microbes, and then that will lead to a an establishment of its own flora. So the argument has been well, once you do a cesarean birth, you're Taking out that avenue of natural protection, or the, you know, the, the introduction of those flora of, of that flora. Um, so there, that's been one of the arguments against <clears throat> cesarean births. But this study, which looked at eighty-one mothers, I think from uh, I think it's a Texas, yeah, Texas Children's Hospital. Um, eighty-one mothers. They controlled for things like um, antibiotic use and other things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, they basically normalised all the data. Yep. Um, and so essentially. Um, then they looked at stool, I think, stool samples from the mother, from the baby, and they over a, like up to six weeks of age. And what they found was, yeah, at the start, there's a slight, there's a, there is a slight difference. Um, and they and what's important is that is the way they looked at this data as well. They looked at um, I was worried about how they actually identified how what, what a bacterial community looks like. I thought maybe they were just using like a like a pattern, like a, a bunch of peaks or something like that. But no, they were looking at whole genes. So they were actually looking at the gene sequences of the bacteria in the in the in the babies between the two different types of birth. Mm-hmm. So they have a fairly comprehensive idea of what's in there. And yeah, they found that up to um, when you get to about four to six weeks of age, it all normalizes. Okay, so, so everyone has there, there roughly is, the same gut flora. Roughly the same. Yeah, there is no real difference between a cesarean birth and a vaginal birth in terms of micro, in terms of microbiota. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so the new idea is, and which I, it had never even occurred to me, was that they think that this team, because of this, thinks that actually what's happening is there's an establishment in utero in the baby's gut. Mm. And that's what, yeah, and, and then, you know, it's, and it's only very small, like it isn't very much because, mm-hmm. um, it, you know, the womb is essentially a sterile place. But in the gut, there's probably a little bit of forming. And then once it gets, once the birth occurs and the baby starts eating outside food, um, that's what basically establishes it and so yeah okay so the in utero thing so it, it it's possibly the start of the seeding process happens through the placenta but yes. the majority of the actual development of the microbiota happens once the baby is born yeah. okay four to six weeks it will take for the what they call for the microbiota to mature 
So if there's a maturation process, it establishes. So at the start, they're saying, yeah, there might be a small community as such in the in the baby's gut, in utero, and then as after it's born, that's when it starts developing properly. Cool. Which is an interesting turnaround. Like, I, it, it, it's, I think that the dogma has been that, no, this happens after birth. Mm-hmm. You know, this is it, it's all it's all external. You know, you don't get bacteria in the womb, um, yeah. in the baby anyway, during – during this process, but but they but that's that's what they're testing now. I think this is something they have to look at a bit more, in a bit more detail, mm. and actually establish this because this is a fairly if this is, if this is what they're actually suggesting, this is actually a it's it, it, it's a quite a um, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's certainly a different way of looking at it. Yeah, I think a lot of the other studies have tended to be sort of correlations, like you know, let's look at a baby who has digestive illnesses or whatever, and look at how they were born. Was it vaginally or was it cesarean or whatever? Which obviously correlation tends to create a lot more problems from a scientific point of view than it uh, solves. We should also point out this is based at the moment on a press release, so I don't think this has gone through no, peer review. Actually, or, it, has it has it? actually been it's been it's been um, authored in Nature Medicine, authored, published in oh. Nature Medicine. Okay. So yes, it has actually been. Let's have a look at this link. Uh, okay. So the quote that I was reading in uh, The Scientist was taken from their press release, but the actual paper, as you say, has been published in Nature Medicine, so a fairly reputable uh, publication. Not that that means it's bulletproof, but uh, very interesting. So uh, mm. pregnant mothers, if someone is trying to shame you or guilt trip you into having a particular type of birth, I would not worry too much about it and go with what your doctor recommends. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, Penny, let's uh, talk about creation of complex life. And about 2.3 billion years ago, our planet went from being oxygen poor to oxygen rich. For a brief period of time, it might even have sustained animal-like life or complex organisms. Uh this might have been some sort of a false start for complex life. Yeah, it's really interesting because save some pretty revolutionary fossil finds, I don't see how we're ever really going to know for sure. Mm. Now, this was really new to me because, you know, I did geology quite a while ago at uni now and it was always like, no oxygen, no oxygen, no oxygen. (laughs) And then boom, you get these amazing banded iron formations, the whole ocean's rust and you've got life and (laughs) off we go. And I had never really thought about what kind of fluctuations happened previously and what the implications of that could have been for evolution. So about 2.3 billion years ago, there was this thing called a Loma Gundy event, which was a, a brief spike in oxygen levels. And you find a bit more organic carbon buried in the deep ocean, which sort of indicates that there must have been quite high oxygen levels. Do we know what caused that rise in oxygen levels? I believe there's no consensus. So, Could have been a volcanic thing. It could have been a bacterial thing. Could have been a number of things, I imagine. And between this age of rocks, I mean, any kind of rock that you're looking at to try and get a record of what's going on 2.3 billion years ago, they've been highly altered. Like it's very, you're looking at quite subtle clues, which is what this study did. And it's looking at um, selenium levels in the rocks to try and get an idea of what was actually going on. So selenium is released when rocks on land are eroded in the presence of oxygen. And then that, selenium gets carried into the ocean and it accumulates on the ocean floor so if there's oxygen in the atmosphere you'd expect a bit more selenium um but apparently also some microbes will metabolize um selenium and they can change the balance between its two isotopes so i'm imagining that this study was incredibly painstaking and that the people Mm. who did it had a lot more patience than i would have but (laughs) What they found by analysing the selenium isotope levels is that there was about five micromoles of oxygen per litre of water. Modern levels, by comparison, are about 325 micromoles. But it's also well above what has been figured out as about the minimum oxygen requirements of really simple marine animals, which is about 0.9. So it's about five times more than what 
some animals today need. Hmm. So the thing that might have been stopping eukaryotic or sort of complex life, a lack of oxygen, is not there. So did it happen? Was there a bit of a false start then or did nothing happen? So, so this increased oxygen period didn't last for very long. How, do we know roughly how long there was that spike? Or I think a couple of million years. I'm not sure. Okay. Which is nothing. In, yeah. You know. Yeah, nothing evolutionary. But the yeah. first few steps could have been taken, so to speak, as in the first few stages of adapting to multicellular life could have maybe begun. But as you say, the, the chances of any fossil record of that is amazingly remote. But uh, it's still an interesting thing to think about and wonder about that. Because obviously, so there'd been single-celled life for billions of years before this, really, hadn't there? Yeah. 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 So from, from about 3.5 billion years ago or possibly even up to 4 billion years ago, we'd had some simple single-celled some life kind of hmm. up until this event 2.3 billion years ago. Interesting. It's a nice little thought experiment anyway because it's, yeah. yeah. And it's also interesting to think that something else, like maybe evolution just needed, oh, not needed, I, I can't stop talking this way. <laughs> <laughs> way but, you know, perhaps a certain amount of complexity and variety had to build up and yeah. randomness had to just happen before it could take advantage of oxygen. Like yeah. maybe the genes that were required just went there. Yeah, a sort of a critical mass. Once you've gotten everything lined up to a certain point, the next step can happen. It's like no matter how carefully I try to think about evolution. I do. <laughs> oh, but there's anthropomorphize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Know, it's not like it's, that. It's, it's very hard not to anthropomorphize it a bit. And, it's so you know, hard. Yeah. In, but, but it's so easy to do, yeah. You'd often hear people say, you know, well, why would this have evolved like that? You know, what, yeah, what, exactly. what was the reason for this to evolve? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's like no, no have bloody to have a reason. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, life yeah. found a way. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Shane, let's finish up on a, uh, a story that I think we've sort of touched on a few times before. It's the creation of synthetic life. Um, and I'm not sure I fully get my head around it, but a new paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is all about creating DNA with not just the usual four letters, G, A, T, and C, but adding another two letters. Obviously, we're not talking actual letters in a book, but these are representative of, is it proteins? Um, it's uh, the trinucleotide phosphates, which are oh, the building okay. blocks of so, <laughs> DNA base. I, I'm not, I might have even got that wrong. Anyway, I think of them as bases. Basically, yeah. they're, little chem they're, they're stable chemicals that are basically the blueprint for life. Um, the DNA code is extremely simple. Um, it's you, you have either an adenine or a thymine binding to each other or a, um, a cytosine or a guanine, and that's how the DNA forms. It forms these long, long chains of these two bases that stick together and only to each other, um, and that's a code. So this, this then codes for any one of 22 amino acids, which then go on to form proteins. Mm -hmm. So with this very simple code, you can produce every single piece of machinery that the cell requires from, you know, um, very basic things like um, packaging, you know, lipids into membranes or much more complicated things like producing um, very complex chemicals that the cell needs. You know, like things like antibiotics, for example, are produced this way mm -hmm. by, a, by, the, by the proteins that are encoded by your genes, by this very simple four-letter base code. Yep. So... We so bearing that in mind, it's a very powerful tool as it as it is. Scientists have this idea that what if we could expand this? What if we could actually increase the capability of this and in introduce more bases in this, in essence, more information into the code, so we could actually take control of it and make it produce even more. You know, make it produce things that nature didn't you know, intend, quote unquote, to create in the first place. Sure, and that's, make it and into that's your own what, little molecular factory type thing. Yeah, yeah. But this is the first step to semi-synthetic life, saying, okay, we now have control over the cell and we can make it do anything we like. I mean, I mean, we, we already have a lot of power to do that anyway because we can make, you know, using gene spot, gen, genetic engineering, we can make cells do a lot of things. But this is an extra step. This is like saying, you know, can we make it from the very start create complex antibiotics, for example, or complex 
industrial solvents or something like that. You know, it, like it, essentially, if we can get something like this working and we could control it on a level that we can say we can introduce a code into the DNA that will then we can then control that and make it do anything we want later on. It's mm-hmm. it's a really possibly a very very powerful tool. But the problem is that yet you know baby steps first. You have to get this to work in the first place. And these researchers, um, I think that, yeah, Floyd Romersberg, who is at the, where is he? Scripps Institute, isn't he? Scripps Institute, yeah. yeah. So in 2014, he'd actually already produced this. He produced an E. coli that, um, an E. coli cell that actually accepted two um, synthetic nucleotide seed bases into the DNA, into their DNA sequences. Unfortunately, they didn't work very well. They were very sickly. Um, they didn't. They, they just were very robust, and they died very quickly. So his this paper now has basically said, okay, we've managed to make them much more robust. Um, they are they are very happy incorporating these new nucleotides into their makeup, and they've actually incorporated that they've, they've they've basically harnessed CRISPR, which is the basically the bacterial immune system, which cuts up, destroys DNA that it doesn't like or that it could be a threat. It has basically harnessed the power of this. Immune, uh, this bacterial Im- 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 immune system to destroy any DNA that doesn't have these two synthetic bases in it. Ah, okay. Yeah. So all that's going to be in those cells are the nucleotide sequences with this, we'll call them X and Y, which is what they call them, X and Y, I mean, um, nucleotide bases, you know, which means that it's much more stable and you don't have the rejection. And yeah, so it carries on to the next generation. Okay, so it so, sort of cancels out the bacteria's built-in immune system that would target any different DNA. Well, it makes it opposite. It, yeah. It, it's, it's actually, it makes it opposite. Yeah, it's, it's so saying anything, mm. yeah, anything that is originally natural is now not natural, if you want to put it that way. But, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, it's really exciting because it's sort of the first, it's the first step in saying, okay, we now made these organisms, they are stable. Next step is to make them work for us. And that's okay. obviously very, very far down the track, but this is the very, very important first step of saying we can actually make these organisms work um, at the, from the very start. They're stable and they're happy and we can just keep on feeding them and they'll keep on growing and we can maintain their lines indefinitely. And that's and, really cool. And also the main reason for adding these two um, molecules, the X and Y, is as a kind of a fail-safe in case these genetically modified bacteria get out into the wild and grow and take over, essentially. Isn't that that's, kind of the I point mean, of it? Obviously not take yeah, over. I mean, but- I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I, I mean that's, it's, it's, a, it's a proof of, princi- proof of principle in that way. Mm-hmm. Proof of concept, sorry. But, um, yeah, but, but, uh, that, that's Rose, Rosenberg's argument that, you know, this is not like a Jurassic Park situation where, um, back, to, back to Jurassic Park, where, you know, um, in, that, in, the, in that film... Their failsafe was that every single dinosaur was female, they couldn't breed, but then, of course, they used frog DNA, which some frogs can revert and become yeah. another gender. Um, and so, that, and so, you know, as, as um, Jeff, Jeff Goldblum says, life found a way. But in this case, it's different because they've actually synthesized these, these nucleotides in the lab. There is no natural equivalent to them. Right. So there is the, the, you know, the idea is that there's no way that the – these bacteria can harness these and, you know, become super blob, super bugs, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, But they can't evolve in a normal way because can... normal evolution would be small steps uh, from something similar to that becomes more common or whatever. But these are so radically different to anything natural that radically. there's no easy step. So. Mm-hmm. Very I mean, cool. They, they'll, they'll get replicated, obviously. There's, there's obviously a way to replicate them. The cell can yes. replicate them. Yeah. But, but they, they have yeah. to feed it the extra genetic um, molecules, I think, or something like that. They have to feed, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, they, they can't replicate. Yeah, they have, to, they have to give it a supply. So that's right. Yeah. So they can incorporate it into the DNA, but they can't make it themselves, which is the important thing here. Yeah. No, that's very cool. It feels like we're maybe on the cusp of like a whole new. When you look at things like CRISPR as well, we're we're so about to start a whole new stage of genetic modification. I think, which could be. Yeah. Very exciting. I mean, it could also bring a whole number of ethical issues with it, but that's any scientific development. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's important to, you know, not to, well, <laughs> I really I hope this isn't sort of, you know, <laughs> it's the start of some backlash where we say, no, we can't use any of these because it's too powerful and thank God it's a position. No. There are some things man was not meant to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's why. <laughs> Frank and DNA. <laughs> <laughs> So busy wondering if you could, you didn't stop to think if you should, etc. Yeah, etc. Et God, um, uh, yeah. 
I think it's. I, I mean, look, I don't really. I, I don't claim to understand this fully because mm. I'm, not a, I'm not. I'm not a molecular biologist to that extent. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm certainly not a synthetic biologist. But um, I. And as I said, like the, the DNA code is already so powerful anyway, mm. and it could do so much, and we can already do so much with it that. I, I sort of, I, I, my mind sort of can't even fathom how far we could take this new thing if we can get it working. You know what I mean? Very like, cool. Yeah. Because yeah, because we already we already use it. We already use this this natural system to create things in the lab, like insulin, for example. Yeah. You know, we use that already, in, um, it, like we, we create it artificially, if you like. So it's already powerful enough, and I can't even imagine how powerful it could get. So. Okay. <laughs> It'll be very exciting to see what happens. But like I said, I think even with this development i think we're still a fairly long way away before it becomes widespread and uh, in mass use but it's very cool to think of it happening hmm. and i think we're done if you want any more information about the stories we talked about uh, or you want to get in touch with us just head to scienceontop.com slash 253 that's what spencer warren from tennessee did he wrote in to tell us that he likes our aussie take on current events uh, yeah, we're all doomed. Uh, and the friendly banter that we have between us. So thank you very much for that feedback, Spencer. We really like knowing what you all uh, like and why you listen to us and, and what you don't like, what we can do to help that. And, of course, don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate uh, if you want to throw some coin our way and help us out. We'd appreciate that. Thanks for joining me today, Shane, Penny and Lucas. No worries. No worries. Thank you. This episode was edited with imaginative resourcefulness by Marcos Benemo. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. A new study finds that people can improve their sleep by camping outside for a week during the winter. The study was published by Hungry Wolves. <laughs> <laughs>